All right, cool. Hey, now, this is Rob here from Rob's School of Music, and we are doing our awesome weekly interview, and then we are blessed to be featuring yet again the ultra-talented, is he that young? So thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me again. Yeah, definitely my pleasure. Now, that was one of my, uh, my favorite chats last time. It just felt so super cool and kind of organic and laid back. Just making sure that we are public everywhere. Cool. All right. Yeah, so um, so we're in music school. We're in New York, and we've been online um, since March, like everyone. And we've done, you know, thankfully, I did the math. It's like almost 3,000 online lessons in six months, which is freaking crazy. Um, but the, the <laughs> yes, very. Um, the thing that we're missing is the interactivity with the students. And uh, I'm trying to prep everyone in the meantime to get them ready for when we get to go back and do shows. And a big thing that freaks everyone out is playing in front of people and sort of stage fright and stuff. So do you have any tips for overcoming stage fright and anxiety as a musician? It's so funny you ask that because like, I, I used to be so anxious. I mean, I still kind of am about people watching me. Like I certainly, I always joke that I don't consider myself a performer, even though I do it as a living. Um, I remember when I used to do piano recitals, like when I was a kid, I was so just scared of messing up or like looking just stupid in front of everyone that like I wouldn't eat for an entire week before I, oh. like if I had a recital, I just wouldn't eat the week before. I was just too anxious. And then after the recital, I'd just go and like, just binge, like my bang, like <laughs> crazy. But, um, to get, to get to a point where I feel comfortable in front of people, a lot of times I, you know, before I play, I just, a lot of it is experience. Like just the more you do it, the more you're like, okay, just another day, another show, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I guess when I go on, like before I go on stage, I, I always kind of like to be alone. So I don't have someone like just distracting my mental energy. I, I'm alone and I like kind of just like take a couple of deep breaths and um, meditate and then you know I get myself in the mindset clear my mind clear all of my emotions out and then I go on stage and I play and when I'm on stage what really helps me is um, a lot of my music I write uh, with a story in mind or with some kind of like visual and so when I'm playing the song uh, I like to think about that story or that visual and walk myself through it and what that does is it not only makes me not nervous anymore, not focus on the people in the audience, but what it does is it also helps me translate what I meant to do with the music even more because I'm in the same mindset as when I when I wrote it. So I feel like I play with even more emotion and it just comes across as like more authentic. Um, and someone also told me once uh, you have to have a short memory when you're on stage playing live because if you mess up, if you just think about that one mistake, you're just gonna your swag's ruined for the rest right. of the show it's not gonna feel good so um having a short memory really helps laughing at yourself like there's been a few shows where i'll make a mistake or i'll hear you know my bass player make a mistake we just make fun of each other with our eyes like i heard that <laughs> it makes it way less serious you know uh and just not dwelling on it being like oh whoops i messed up whatever moving on like i still shred <laughs> you know? So those are some some tips. Oh, and, and one of my friends who plays in a band that tours a lot told me that when he has a bad show, he likes to view the next day as getting revenge. So, like, you know, getting revenge on a show that isn't that great is kind of a fun way to think about um, playing live the next day so that you're less nervous and the mindset you have is more like, oh, I'm going to kill this one. Like, didn't get it last time, but I'll get it today. That's a cool way to look at it. Definitely. Yeah. I, you know, having, having fun with it, I think is the most important thing. Like this has to be fun. If it's not fun, what the hell are we doing? Right. All right. We we're, completely... we're already getting questions about what is your new tattoo? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Instantaneously. <laughs> I'm with uh, my friend Hesse right now. Um, I, I'm just getting a, a bird. I love birds. Birds are my, favorite animal and I have a ton of birds and like a walking aviary and I really like art style and, and she's just very talented and um, a really good friend so to me it, it's like she's marking my body with art and like really special and it's a bird so. 
That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. T totally, completely off everything I, I planned on asking. Um, we know that you you have the uh, the pet duck, and oh, yeah. uh, we uh, we watch all that stuff. And my girlfriend, you know, Sam, she she loves that. She wanted to know if if you uh, if you play music for for your pet duck. Do you is music like part of how you communicate and serenade? Like, cause we play music to our animals. So I just don't know if that's a weird thing I do or other people do that or. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know if he enjoys it or not. I can't tell from his dead eyes, but what I can tell is that I guess like he likes food, <laughs> 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 but no, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, I don't really play to him particularly, but he does, he can tell when it's like, a good riff, I guess. Like he'll come over and watch. There but you I think, go. honestly, I think he just wants food. Um, <laughs> and he he'll ruin a lot of my recordings. Sometimes I'll be like <laughs> recording something really quiet, and then all my chickens and my duck will like just make noise in the background. I'm like, no, that was like, such a good take. <laughs> <laughs> that's not very many people get to have that as a reason for a take to be ruined. So that's beautiful <laughs> in its own magical way. Yeah, maybe it's perspective. Maybe I should view it as the take is enhanced. Now there's like extra ambient noise. There you go. People are like, what is that effect you're using? And they're scouring reverb for this pedal, but it's just a duck. <laughs> yeah, I've even gone as far as to try to isolate the exact frequency of like a, like a, a cluck. Like, I'm like, where is it? I'm trying to take it out post, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> um, so, so back to music um how did you get started you know you, you're you're so incredibly talented and your style is so unique but there's piano there's guitar there's so many influences in what you're doing like what was the thing that made you say this is what i want to do you know <laughs> it's crazy i feel like in some ways i didn't really choose the music life the music life chose me i'm just kidding no <laughs> <laughs> no i I grew up playing classical and uh, classical music. I played piano and violin. I played in two orchestras, and I grew up in like a hugely competitive classical circuit. And admittedly, at the time, I didn't enjoy it. It was actually a lot of pressure for me, especially as a, someone who doesn't enjoy being in front of audiences, like someone who's just nervous and kind of anxious all the time. Um, I just associated it with stress. And then I got really sick uh, from all the pressure, and then I had to drop everything. And it was during that time. Where I just play guitar, um, and I taught myself just how to play some basic chords, and, and I started writing my music as like an outlet, and it was really helpful for my depression and um, the ailment that I was going through at the time. I guess I can say it was it was an eating disorder, and I was like in the hospital on and off for four years. I think yeah, four years, um, and yeah, it was during that time where I, I really rediscovered my passion for music because like in teaching myself guitar it was like um, I could take uh, I, I put every, my self value not in like how I look or like what other people think of me but in like my self esteem came from what I could do with my hands and what I could like teach myself to do if I just work really hard and I think that's really stuck with me so guitar has been such a val valuable outlet for me emotionally but also it's like my self-esteem. I'm like, hell yeah. Like I love playing. It like makes me feel like I actually have control over something in my life. Um, and you know, I was an art teacher. I worked in an art school and I taught kids and wow. slowly, but surely I had to, I kept on having to hire a substitute because I was going on tour and then life just got so crazy. One day I decided the, the right thing for me to do is to quit. Because I might as well give music a fair shot, and also it's not fair to the kids that they always have to get some rando coming into the classroom like every couple of months, like hi, you guys not here <laughs> for the next month. So it was just not fair, um, and that's how I kind of started doing the band thing full time. I think in a lot of ways, like other people putting their faith in me made me believe in myself a little more. Like all these companies giving me endorsements, I, like I remember the first time someone gave me a guitar for free, I was like, really? Like, I can keep this like oh my god this is so expensive like are you sure I can't pay for it and they're like no like it was a strand from Stranger Guitars I remember thinking like wow like that's so nice like that's like amazing that he would give like some random girl like a guitar 
but it made me really practice hard because I was like, okay, I want to feel like I deserve this. And that's a mentality that also for me to this day. Is like, I feel like the reason I work hard is like, one day I want to feel like I deserve everything. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I mean, first of all, you, you definitely deserve all of it. The talent is outrageous. But I think the perspective that you just shared that, you know, most people, you know, I see it with students and I see it through my musical journey, you know, you get in a band, you start playing, and then your goal is to become a rock star and famous and get all the endorsements and the free stuff and the rock and roll and the blah, blah, blah. But you got the right attitude. Someone gives you a piece of equipment, you feel honored and you want to feel as though you deserve it and 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 work towards becoming even better. And that's the right way to look at life 100%. So that was brilliant what yeah. you just said, really. Thanks. I got to say that the one thing that has helped me the most is authenticity and like staying true to my North Star, which is just like I play music because I love music. And it's like, again, like a valuable outlet for me. It's sacred to me. So everything else is just noise. Like all I care about is making awesome music. And then I also want to, you know, everyone who's invested their time, their finances, even their emotional energy into me. Like I remember that. And every time I get maybe jaded or disillusioned, I try to think about that. And then it makes me like want to work hard again. That's so cool. That's so cool. That is right there. That is the most profound thing that, that, you know, we can share to people, you know, who are, who are listening and going to listen, like, give a shit about what you're doing because it's important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, know yourself, like know yeah. where you can compromise. And I guess sometimes it takes a while to find your voice, but when you do like stay true to it. hundred percent. What is your, um, your process in terms of how you write stuff? Is it, do you, you know, some players, they, they start at point A and they get to point B quickly. Some people collect bits of riffs, you know, your style with the fingers and all that, there, there's so much, cool stuff happening like what is what's your process my process is idiotically slow but i I, I like the results uh basically i'll sit like i play in alternate tunings i play in a bunch of tunings i don't really use shapes like i don't i know theory like i studied it classically but i I really never think about it in fact i think theory did for me was help me internalize some some patterns maybe and like meter like that's rolled into me for sure being able to play the metronome um, without a metronome, like being able to stay steady, that's something that you know, uh, classical theory definitely helped me with. Ear training, having a good ear. But um, okay, so like all the skills I learned from my classical theory training, I, I use for guitar, but I don't think about my melodies in terms of like chord shapes or like what works theory wise. I sing everything. Um, I'll sit there and I'll kind of noodle around until I find like a basic bare bone blend that I like. And sometimes I'll have a specific melody in mind. And so I'll sing, like, yeah. Uh, I remember recently, actually, the other, the other week, I, I had, like, I was walking and this melody came to me. It was like, da 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 It was just like that. I was just like, oh, okay, that makes me want to dance. And so, like, I went home and I sat down with the guitar and I kind of just figured it out by singing. And then I, um, what I'll first do is I'll play a very basic line. I wish I had a guitar. I didn't even take that. I'll play like a really basic line, like no no chords even, just like single notes. And then I'll use my ear to hear the harmonies that I want, and then I'll fill it in, and I'll wow. I call it pimping out a, a riff where it's like yeah. I think a lot of people struggle because they try to write something that's like too complicated, and it's like so much in their head they get overwhelmed. But like if you start simple, you can always build up or take away if that's. Sometimes you need to take away it too. It gets like too uh, convoluted. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's my process. Is I sit there and just sing stuff and like teach it to me really, teach it to myself really slowly. That's really cool though. I mean, you know, I, I try to, a big thing that we do within the school is we try and people come in and they want to play other people's music. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. There's something to learn from everyone. But at the same time, I think music is this amazing outlet where you can, if you're having a bad day, you can write a song. If you're having a good day, you can write a song. If you're in love, if you get broken up with, if you had stomach ache, whatever's going on, you know, there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot to talk about these days. Yeah. And a lot of the kids that we come through, they'll just kind of layer things on top of things and then start stripping away. And uh-huh. that's um, less is more sometimes, but it's cool to be able to hear it all in your head and put it together. 
definitely. I'd say that like right another advantage of writing with your voice is that you're not confined by your own abilities. Like some people they get stuck in a rut. I get this a lot of people playing standard is like they know all the shapes, so they're just playing what is convenient and what their hands are comfortable with doing. But I find that like I end up getting better at guitar every time I write a new song because I'm doing stuff that I just don't know how to do yet. And I'm just like slowly like I'm letting the melody dictate what the song is so that I'm not limited by what's comfortable to me. Right. I'm learning quite comfortable. I'm like, this is hard. <laughs> I'm like, then I learn it. I'm like, well, now I can do this crazy jump and I can do this like tap run thing that I didn't think I could do just because I slowed it down. Very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, any cool new effects that you're messing around with these days? I always see every so often on Instagram a new pedal or something. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got really excited about, uh, there's this pedal I got sent called the Slowly Melting. Um, it's by uh, Dirge Effects. This wonderful guy named Evan runs it. Um, and it's it sounds like a fuzz, but it's actually like a glitched out delay. And I'm not going to say too much about it because I actually feel like quite ignorant. So I don't want to say the wrong thing. But I will say that it was really inspiring. What I really liked about it was with a lot of like kind of fuzz-ish distortion effects, um, you lose a lot of clarity. Uh, and it just gets like mud city really fast. So single right. notes are like little even tap runs just get swallowed up in the abyss. But with this pedal, it almost sounds like it's like being parallel processed or something. So there's like the original clean signal with a lot of attack, but then there's all this like nice texture around it. So I remember when I plugged in, I was like, this is so cool. Like there's so much clarity, but it's also like really gritty and like it's got so much sass. So that really excited me. Uh, I've been messing around with some Helix like synth phones, uh, and I've also I got a Juliana the stereo chorus from Morris. Um, excited to do more of that as well. I love chorus; my favorite. Yeah, I just um, I I just did a deal with Walrus, and they sent me a ton of pedals, and they do crazy stuff. And and I like when one box can do lots of different things because the real estate yeah. is so valuable on your pedal board, so you want to make sure. You're getting a lot of bang for your your little footprint there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I love that you know not not that it's surprising in any way because your tone is so great, but you're so specific about what's going on with the different sounds. Um, I don't remember if I had mentioned last time, but pre-COVID, one of the coolest things I think about our school is we have a giant case in the in the waiting area, and it's full of my entire 25 years worth of effects pedals I've collected, and we let the wow. students. We let them take them out like library books to try and, you know, and I, I can go, I'm the kind of guy where I'll just sit there and I'll, I'll take something and I'm going, uh, this way or this way. And you can't even see my fingers moving, but I can hear the difference. You know, that's what is that? Some acoustic pedal, but yeah, uh, just on the desk randomly. I don't even know why, <laughs> but how did you develop an ear or do you have any tips to develop an ear in terms of hearing what you want in your head and then being able to replicate it with whatever gear you have, be it, you know, a, a starter pack line six spider all the way up to, you know, the helix or ax effects or something top of the line. It's one of the most frustrating things starting out where it's like you have this idea in your head, but you're like, how do I get this tone? And I think that's something that just comes with um, experience, like trying out a, a lot of different things and really understanding what the knobs do to like change different parameters. Uh, I know what's also helped me is finding out, like, I'll listen to bands I like and then try to find out what gear they're using and how they achieve certain tones in their record. Like, you know, I used to be that person in the front, like, looking at the pedal board, kind of seeing what it, what was that reverb. It was really cool. Like, yeah. the, the tail, it sounded really interesting. Like, um, or you can find that stuff online now, too. But I guess another thing is, what I like about effects is I don't think there's like a right or a wrong way to use them. Like, of course there's certain rules about how you should, um, how you should structure your signal chain. But I think sometimes, you know, there's really interesting results, um, that happen when you break the rules as well. Like putting like a, I don't know, like a reverb before distortion or distortion after, you know, all these, you, know, you just never know. So, Every time someone has gear questions to me and stuff, I'm always like, well, I can give you advice, but also I just think you should go try it out and use your ear because you know what you want to achieve. Like, you know what you like. I don't know what you like. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm an expert on everything because 
I'm really not. Like, I did all this shit. Like, sorry, all this crap. <laughs> Try We're to, musicians. Like, <laughs> it happens. But my, my shirt says fuck on it. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Wow. Not canceled. <laughs> nah, you're good. I did all this stuff like trial and error and it's like on the record I'm like okay I'm just gonna play with this until I really like what I hear and I feel like it it's the exact color I want um yeah that's my advice it's <laughs> just like have fun <laughs> no it's good advice though I mean I think a lot of musicians especially now Instagram has been like the worst like Instagram makes people feel bad about themselves in the real world with uh, yeah. you know fitness and looks, but as musicians, it makes us feel bad because you see these pornographic pedal boards that like no one could really have, and you know like I got these kids who are like, oh my gosh, I just have like a a DS one and a DD three delay, and uh, I'm like, dude, just sit there and twist those knobs. Every sound you need exists with exactly what you have, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think pornographic pedal board is hilarious. That's a great way to describe it. That's what it feels like. It does. It's crazy. I, mean, I remember as a kid, like when the sweet work catalog would come, like that was like the Bible, you know? And now you just, it's on your phone, all these things, and it's over overwhelming. Yeah. You know, what I feel bad about is my pedal board looks like such shit. It's like so messy. There's like all the cables are like mismatched and it's just like because i'm such like a in the moment i'll just take things out put things in i'm not like ocd enough about that so i'll look at all these like perfectly aesthetic like spotless boards that are yeah. just totally uniform and color coordinated i'm like whoa i need to clean my act up <laughs> <laughs> nah keep it cool i mean i don't know if i can twist the camera you see back over there yeah it, it's like I'm just constantly pulling things in and out. That's the way to do it because, like, when you feel inspired, just just go for it. Yeah. Rock, and roll, rock and roll is not clean; it's dirty, and that's how it should be. And it is such a dominating factor in my life. Like, all, I just went through my effects and I sorted them by type and color, and then I, I you know, had it nice. And then just in like three days, it looked like, you know, like I'm through my board. Just like, under, like just everything I did was done. <laughs> like, there's no point. <laughs> it's okay. It's better that way. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So for your most recent record, what was, um, which is fantastic and the artwork is beautiful and the music, fantastic technicolor. Um, what was the recording process for that? Like, did you guys get everything done before COVID kicked in? How, what's it like releasing a record during this? So dumb. <laughs> it like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember I hauled my I busted my ass like to get all these songs written in time so that I could send it to my bandmates and they could put their parts on it. Everything was so rushed. We compromised on the mix. Like we did so many because like we had to make this deadline that the label set and then we also had to make it in time for this big headliner tour we had planned. So you know we had all our ducks in a row. We met the deadline and then bam, all gone. So it just sh goes to show you that, you know, deadlines are kind of arbitrary. I don't think good art should be rushed. Um, sometimes I think it's important to have a deadline. Otherwise, you just sit there and just redo the same thing over and over again, and you can be kind of neurotic about it. So I think it is important to, like, set deadlines and goals for yourself. But I don't know. For me, it's been a big lesson in that, like, you know, you can work really hard and you can do everything right. But in the end, nature wins. Yeah. We can do about it um yeah and we try to have like a good attitude about it like during this time i'm just like well i'm grateful to have time at home to reflect and to write new music i think i have like maybe 50 percent of a new album done wow um yeah I've, I've been really inspired actually being home uh and we did like a live uh playthrough of it in lieu of having a headliner tour so we're gonna throw like a album viewing party maybe um, next month. But yeah, it's just been humbling. <laughs> it's, I, my heart goes out because so many of my friends are, you know, musicians and we're all in this together and we're all suffering in different ways. But the positive thing that I keep saying to myself, be it as a music school owner and as a guy who, you know, would tour and gig and stuff is 
We can only can control what we can control. And as yeah. long as we still luckily have the ability to connect with people this way, you know, these, these live stream shows and playthroughs and things like that, that's a really cool different avenue that was never really a, a, a concrete option until it had to be. And at least that exists. That's exciting as a fan to still be able to watch our, you know, heroes do cool stuff. Yeah. It's like, I will say like live stream shows don't cut it. There's something so cool about being in a room with a bunch of people yeah. who are also stoked to see the same band as you and there's like excitement in the air. There's like, this mystique um, and people make new friends at shows and you just can't really do that online. Completely true. I'm just trying to be positive. <laughs> oh, oh no! I'm just, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to like shit on the mic. No, it's su <laughs> it sucks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for comedians. Like, can you imagine? Tell, I, I've seen some comedians do live stream sets, and it's like, where's the laughter? You don't know if your joke hit. Or <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I can't even try to imagine what that must feel like it's hard enough when the people are in the room not laughing but when you're just staring at a reflection of yourself no way no I know. thanks so strange <laughs> um what so so now reminiscing about touring and being on the road i think we touched on this the last time but we'll kind of maybe revisit it um what's a typical day in the life uh on like show day like, when do you get to the venue, sound check? Like, how does all that work? Well, I mean, we're still at a stage where we don't have a bus or anything. Like, we still drive ourselves. It's just also very cost efficient to drive yourself. Sure. Um, I'm always like, I'd rather just take home more money. Like, it's fine. I'll tough it out. I don't need, like, a crazy bed or anything. Um, but I guess it's roll up to the venue. Uh, it's like... Usually it's like we're all super sleep deprived. We're all like kind of, uh, I guess like the first day we're, we're not sleep deprived yet. So we have energy. So maybe we've got like excitement in our eyes still and we're like happy and smiling. But I, I say it really depends on like which when in tour you're looking at us. <laughs> like maybe like three fourths of the way through we're all tired. We roll up, maybe we're an hour late because we, we just, you know, van popped a flat tires and thing like so uh and then do the sound check usually we all kind of do our own thing like on tour i think being in a band it's really important to have alone time and privacy because you're basically confined in a small vehicle with people all day so it's important for everyone to communicate um and take time for themselves and, and express when they need space so we all kind of do our own thing um then before the show we'll kind of gather in the green room and, you know, just say some encouraging words to each other, hang out, and then go play the show. And then afterwards, we usually load out ourselves. Um, and we want to hang out usually, but there's usually no time because we have to drive. So we'll usually do part of the drive um, the night of, and we'll end up rolling up at where we're staying, which is usually a hotel, uh, at around, I don't know, like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and then lobby call will be at like 8 or 9 a.m. So we get in a good solid four hours. <laughs> it's just exhausting. But, you know, I miss it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's – it's. I think the process is awesome no matter what stage of the game. Um, and I think just being able to be out there and play for people and have that life – is sort of the dream of most people who pick up an instrument. So I think it's really cool to hear that it's it's not all, you know, champagne and roses, but it's still pretty awesome just to be out there doing it. So very Yeah. Cool. I will say I wish that I, I love traveling. I love the excitement of being somewhere new every day and I love like meeting new people. But I will say that I it sucks that you don't have more time to explore. Like I wish to, it would be kind of logistically a nightmare but uh and financially but it would be cool sometimes if you could have like a day a show uh one day and then the next day you could just have an off day just to see what the area is about yeah that would be really cool yeah but you know we're on a schedule here <laughs> right right um let's talk a bit about your amazing signature ibanez guitar so i remember um 
I think I mentioned last time as well, I was admiring it at NAM back in January because green is my favorite color and anything sparkly is just badass, so home run. Um, and you were standing very close to where I was, but I didn't want to be like, hey, because that would have just been strange. But um, what was that process like in developing that? It was pretty streamlined because basically, like, Ibanez sent me that first Talman that I had that was a telly. Um, and I loved it. And I already loved the neck. It's easy when you already have like a guitar model that you just vibe with um, and feels good to ready. So I, all I really changed was uh, I knew I wanted it to be a strap style guitar. I might release a telly version. I did say that. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted my first guitar to for be a strat with a Seymour Duncan 5-2 set. Um, just because of the most dynamic pickups that I've played and, and they just them with my box AC30 is just like, oof, I love the tone. It, like, it's clean, but it just breaks up so nicely with my loop. Um, and it's pretty great, conducive to like the finger style thing where you depend a lot on finger stone, or sorry, finger tone, not finger stone, <laughs> finger tone for dynamic. Um, and then I really just changed up the color. Uh, I wanted it to be kind of like a bold color that you don't see too often. Maybe it's polarizing. Some people think it's disgusting. It looks like puke. But some people, you know, it reminds me of like Nickelodeon, Slime Time yeah. Live. Scene. And I, I kind of wanted to go for that. Uh, what else did I change? Uh, oh, the fretboard. Like, I guess we went with a U shape uh, instead of the wizard neck, just because for some people, the wizard neck is too thin. So it, it's just easier for people with bigger hands to play. It's an intermediate style neck. Um, oh, oh, no, of course, I changed the tuning to ICG BE, because that's a tuning that I use a lot. Uh, comes tuned to that. And uh, the string gauge, I believe, are 11, or maybe 12s. 12s, so 12s. Oh, 12s. Whoa. Okay. Maybe 11s. Mine are 12s. But hey, if know. you're going to... It should be the way you do it. So if you use 12s, it better be 12s, Ibanez. Listen up, so you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes, it's hard for bending, but it definitely gives you finger strength. And I will say thicker strings equal better tapping tone. 100%. I just, uh, unfortunately, after uh, the news that Eddie had passed away, I went on Sweetwater and immediately ordered one of the, uh, the Wolfgang guitars, and it shipped with nines. And I'm trying to tap, and I'm like, what? Like, it's... Yeah, Lindsay. Doll hair like, under my fingers. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the people, I mean, students come to me, they're like, well, how do you tap so cleanly? Like, my, I just don't get a lot of sustain. I'm like, well, what strings are you playing? They're like, nines. I'm like, there's your problem. Like, that yeah. child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was blown away. Like, I don't know why EVH or I guess Fender ships them out that way, but it's it was not fun to play like that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's better for shredding, right? Like, lighter string gauge. Yeah, I don't know. Like it, it just it it felt like a toy in my hands. So I don't know. And I played tens. Like I'm not a like twelves. Jesus, you're a champion. But even from yeah. tens to nines, it felt like uh, I used to use elevens. I mean, it hurt my hands. <laughs> not, a, not a flex, but there was a brief period of time where I switched to thirteen. I knew that was coming. Like <laughs> Stevie Ray Vaughan over here. <laughs> um. Let's see, I got, my, I got my notes here. I have a cool thing we're going to do at the end. We're going to do like rapid fire questions, but I'm saving that. That's going to be si silly in the best way. Um, do you have any advice to give to a, not that there should be a differentiation, but unfortunately, sometimes in this world, there is a young female guitarist getting out there and stepping into this world that is a rough world for people of all genders. What, what would you say to someone getting out there, joining their first band, doing gigs, you know, what, what should they look out for? Oh man, it's a loaded one. There's so many challenges being a female. And a lot of them I didn't understand until I got really deep into this industry. Um, you know, I will say just for anyone really starting out, like it's easy to feel like you're going to get fooled a million directions. So I think one thing that really helped me was understanding who I am and like what I want to stand for and what I want to do with my art and what I want to represent with my craft um, and getting my priorities straight. Like, what do I actually care about? What doesn't matter to me? 
Uh, I think that's helped me avoid situations where people try to tell me what to do um, as a woman and how I should represent myself. Um, it's hard. I feel like you really have to get a, a tough, a thick skin as well because people will always try to shut you down just because you're a woman. Um, misogyny is definitely real, uh, you know, and I think it's it's easy for me to sit here and say, just don't care about what other people say. It's, it's difficult. Like you read hate and it gets to you. I think it like resonates in your mind and it ultimately can affect your decision making in the future. But, you know, I think if you have strong boundaries for yourself and you really have a strong sense of like who you are, all that stuff can affect you less. I'm not saying it won't affect you, but it, it at least won't feel debilitating and crippling and, and discourage you from moving forward. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like, yeah, I do get hate and I, I, you know, recently went through a bunch of bullshit, but for me, what got me through it is remembering the people who do believe in me and the people who do support me and people who invested in me, even though I didn't really have anything I could offer them at the time. And for me, that is so powerful. And that's something that I, I still take, um, really heavily to this day. And I think that helps me stay encouraged <laughs> moving Good. forward. Good. Nah, you, you deserve it. We're friends and fans over here, so don't worry. No no negative in this nonsense. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I, it was so funny. I uh, I was just reflecting with my with friends the other day that I used to be so – I had a guy tell me that, like, I wasn't a real musician because I didn't write with theory once, like, a long time ago when I was starting out. And I remember I was so um, – self-conscious of my playing that I was scared to play through an amp. Like every time I went to Guitar Center and I had to try an amp, I just didn't want anyone to hear me. So I would turn like as low as possible. And it was, it was really crazy. Cause now I'm like, whatever, I don't care. And, and, and that just took time. I think that just took really um, honing my own voice and, and uh, being around people who were encouraging. And then before you know it, I'm just like transformed. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something just how the chips have fallen, the majority of my students are, are girls, teenage girls. It's just, however, that's just the way the schedule worked out. And I take such responsibility in encouraging everyone, but particularly like watch out for the BS. And uh, I mean, I see it with uh, you know my girlfriend. She's a singer. We play in a band together. And we've had bandmates along the way who are like, well, you know, if you were up there more in front and shaking and da-da-da-da-da, and she's like, I'm like, first of all, you're out of the band. How dare you? Second of all, what what decade are you living in yeah, right? where you think you can behave this way to someone who's just trying to do a job? You know, she's a great singer. She's a pretty girl. She's a great singer. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff has to be. It's just so I know. outdated. Um, is music visual? I mean, parts of it are visual. But at the end of the day, close your eyes. Can you hear my gender? No. Like, exactly. Does it matter? You know? Yep. Yeah. It's It's... It can be frustrating when people try to encourage you to sexualize yourself. I'm all for, like, if you got it, flaunt it. That's fine. But I will say that, like, there is something to be said about letting your ability and skills speak for yourself and, and not depending on your external appearance or anything. You know? 100%. And if you, like, I don't mean to misspeak, everyone can do whatever they want. If someone wants to flaunt one thing, that's completely their choice. But it's certainly not the place of a dude to be saying to anybody that you got to do this. That's just, that that gets you a punch right in the mouth as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And it's it's frustrating. One of the things, the challenges I face um, is knowing, like, a woman always, like, feel like we just want to work, right? We're trying to keep it professional, but sometimes, like, you, it's just motives and intentions are unclear and lines get blurred. And it's, it's really frustrating because on one hand, like, I don't ever want to have to burn a bridge with someone. So it's like sidestepping advances can be really exhausting because you're trying sure. to be cool. You want to be like this, um, you know, for lack of a better word, just big bitch that just denies people. But, you know, it's just, it gets exhausting. And I think that's a challenge that a lot of my female peers face is they don't know when a guy is serious about working or when he has ulterior motives. <laughs> yes. And some guys are so good at making it look one way, and all of a sudden they flip the switch, and then you're blindsided. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, and it's heartbreaking because it, it should yeah. never be that way. And it sucks because, like, they do leverage their power sometimes too. So it's like never succumb to that. 
like it's I think easier said than done, but you know, you get people like Harvey Weinstein who's like, like if you want to be famous, like you got to do like that's so bullshit. I'm so excited for that to die out. Um, I am optimistic. I feel like we have so much more female representation now than ever, and a lot of girls are encouraged to, you know, play guitar and pursue genres that are more male dominated. So that stuff is going to die out. If you yeah, yeah. But I mean, I I'm just. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you first, of course. Oh, I was like, I'm so optimistic that I'm looking forward to the day where um, it's not going to be like a wild, crazy thing that there's like a girl on stage or something. <laughs> you know? Right? It's it's outrageous yeah. that that's even a thing. Like, I remember I was reading an article like, this is the first year where all of these female artists are getting signature instruments and everyone's supposed to be like, wow, this is crazy. Well, why was that never a thing before? You know, like... Music is music. Art is art. It's silly. Yeah. It's, it is great that we're moving forward, I guess. Yes. 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 That's what we want. Keep forward. Yeah. I'm going to, I see, a, 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 we got a question here. Do you ever meditate before hitting the stage? You know, I wish I was better at meditation. My mind is a mess. But um, for me, playing music in itself, is meditation because I feel like I clear my mind and I'm only really thinking about my emotion and the story I'm trying to tell. Um, visual art for me is meditation too. I'm just like drawing and mark making and it can be really therapeutic. But uh, I guess before stage, I don't like to talk to anyone. I like to be alone. That's a sort of meditation just to clear my mind. So yes, kind of my answer. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, with the, with the with the you know the artistic side of things, one of the questions I always try and ask is, you know, people know us as musicians, and unfortunately, just society tends to make the assumption that everyone is one dimensional, and the thing that you know them for must be the only possible thing they fill every waking moment of their life with. But you said you're an art teacher, and you talk about creating. Uh, what what's your chosen medium for for you know being an artist outside of music? I love just pen and ink. Like, you know, just black and white line work. I think I just like getting lost in the little details. That being said, there's something really nice about painting. Just the act of even just gessoing a canvas or something. It's really therapeutic and awesome. Um, Watercolor is fun, too. I like everything. I know that's a cop-out answer. But... No, it's not. I mean, that's it's why limit yourself, you know? So mm -hmm. that's okay. Uh, you did the artwork for the, the most recent record, right? Mm-hmm. So what was that? Is that I'm trying to, is that watercolors? Uh, mixed media is mostly gouache actually on board, and I used colored pencils to do some of the detailing. I was limited because I was like in a dingy studio, like with just a bunch of supplies that I got at like CVS and Michaels. So looks um, great. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a bunch of different things. <laughs> I told you we'll buy a print of that. If you get them printed up, we're first in line. We're gonna put it right in our living room. Oh yeah, I'll send you guys one. We legit talk about that. Like, I'm not even saying it to say it. Like, as soon as you posted it, Sam was like, "That's amazing." And they're like, "Yeah, let's let's get one." I know exactly yeah. where it'll go. I'd I'd love to. I'll, I'll have some made. I'll have one sent to you guys. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Wow. That, yes. All right. She's probably watching, and she's going to comment in a second. Um. Yeah. All right. So let's let's do one more gear question and then my rapid fire thing so you say it's uh you're on a desert island i think you've probably answered this question piecemeal throughout the conversation but i gotta ask it you're on a desert island you get one guitar one amp and one pedal what would you take one guitar one amp and one pedal i'd probably take my at10 that's what i use at home but then do I get replacement tubes? Because I burn yes, out of tubes. Yeah, yes, you have unlimited power, replacement tubes, replacement strings, replacement picks, all the uh, the accessories, yes. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I'll get replacement tubes because, like, I mean, if I play 12 year tubes, the same tube is going to sound like crap. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. So AC10 and then maybe, like, um, Ooh, I like I want to say I like EQ pedals because you can like really shape your tone to like do different things. I mean, it kind of doubles as like even like a gain pedal. It gives you a little extra gas at times, but it's not fun, you know. Like it's just more of like a a tool to shape your tone. So maybe if I had one pedal, I would do. 
gosh. Ooh, something that has like multiple features. So probably actually, um, there's this French company called Collision Devices and they make this pedal called the Black Hole Symmetry and it's a fuzz delay and reverb. And it's great for making like ethereal soundscapes and like generating noise. I feel like even just generating noise could be fun, like finding a way to like do it really controlled. Um, but that being said, it would, it would have like a really nice reverb and a built-in delay in it already. And you could probably even do, oh, you know what? Okay, so either Black Hole Symmetry or the Ivan has released, Ivan has released this, um, the Echo Shifter, and I found a way to use it as like a spring, a slapback reverb, a delay, and uh, a chorus. So that could be a really nice like Swiss Army pedal. Yeah. Well, uh, so yeah, that again, one of those two, and then the guitar, of course, my Talman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that the amp and the guitar, I figured I could guess the pedal. It's always a fascinating question because. It, it, if it's just one, what's it going to be? You you have the right idea. One that does many things. Um, the EQ pedal. Tim Pierce did a video about that. How it's like that is the everything all in one pedal because you can make a humbucker sound like a single coil and vice versa. Yeah. Use it as a gain pedal. Yeah. Throw in the effects loop for a, a, an extra channel even. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a useful pedal that I think a lot of people aren't excited by, but it's actually like for me, it's an essential. One hundred percent. Yeah. Here's Sam's response to uh, about the print. Yay. Aww. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So this is my uh, my grand finale question here. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'm going to pull them up here. Uh, nothing heavier, political or strange, just all music related. Okay. Uh, and you just, you'd pick one or the other. You could take a second to think about it. And uh, there are no wrong answers except for one where there is a wrong answer, but I'll tell you if you get it wrong. And, okay. if, you get it, and if you get it wrong, it's just a difference in opinion. It's cool. We can still be friends. Yeah. All right, here we go. Humbucker or single coil? Single coil. Fender or Gibson? Or Ibanez, Ibanez obviously. Are, but... they are they listening? Is Ibanez listening? Yeah. All right, Ibanez. We'll scratch that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ibanez, Ibanez or Ibanez? <laughs> uh, uh, God, didn't see that coming. Um, <laughs> all right, well then, oh no, I got to skip a bunch of these then because they're out of that. Okay. Oh, uh, you, it's okay. You can still. Uh, a, a Strat style body or a Telly style body? Oh, I love Tellys. Like I grew up playing Tellys, but I also like Strat. I like them both. Okay, that's fair. You can do both. It's all right. <laughs> Um, if it, if it were to be a Gibson style guitar, would it be a Les Paul style or an SG style? I've never, okay, Les Paul are really heavy, so I have to go with the SG. Cool. Okay. For acoustics, Martin or Taylor? Uh, oh, dang. That's awesome. Hard because I... Or well, Ibanez. <laughs> Ibanez. Because like, <laughs> no, I, I started on a Martin, they're still so warm, but Taylors have this like nice brightness to them that I also like, I don't know, ah, I've been <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny with the, the Martin Taylor question, of all of those guitar related questions, they each serve a purpose. So it's a really difficult one to answer. So that that's okay. It's meant to okay. be annoying. Don't worry. Uh, in terms of amplifiers, Marshall or Fender? Ooh. Uh... Probably, I haven't played through much Marshall, but I did play through a uh, Deluxe Reverb initially, so I'll go Fender. Okay, and now some effects-related questions. Delay or Reverb? Uh, ooh, okay, Delay, because you make that shit sound like a Reverb. You, <laughs> so you get it, you get it. <laughs> uh, fuzz or Overdrive? Ooh, Overdrive, because I feel like you... Like sometimes I was just you, you are limited in what you can play. Like some of the details are lost. So, Rujai. Okay. <laughs> Phaser or chorus? Chorus. Okay. <laughs> Be Beatles or Rolling Stones? Rolling Stones. Okay. So. Is that, is that the one where I got it wrong? No, 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 no. You haven't gotten any wrong yet. You're good. Don't worry. No, no, no. You're good. <laughs> You're good. Um. I see. Here, someone says this. There, there should be an acoustic, but wasn't there? They make an acoustic version of the Tom and Red. I'm not sure. I think, I think they do. I, I really think they do because I think. All right. I'm pretty sure they do. Yeah. Yeah. Let's in see. fact, 
I know of a blue one they make because one of my students has it. And it's oh. a really cool shape for an acoustic. I got it right here, you guys. Uh, it, ooh, that's a nice black one. It's, um, there it is. No, it's yeah. blurry. It's a really cool shape for an acoustic. It's smaller, but they sound awesome. <laughs> All righty. So, and in the world of the Beatles, John or Paul? Paul, I don't know. I don't, I, I, That's okay. I That's fine. That's okay. Uh, Paul, Paul is the right. Paul is the right answer. It's okay. That is the right answer. Paul. I should say Paul. John. Or John. <laughs> <laughs> now, guys, Paul is the answer. Come on now. <laughs> Paul, I do like every every person I met was named Paul. I've liked. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna alienate fifty percent of the world right now. I feel like if I met John Lennon in a real life, he'd kind of be an asshole. And well, I've heard, just... I've heard he was kind of like rude to like women, yeah. right? But. Yeah, and I just, I can't get behind that. Yeah, okay. Your friends well, get it. They know, they know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Zeppelin or Pink Floyd? Zeppelin. Okay. And then uh, if on the Pink Floyd topic, would it be Dark Side or The Wall? I feel like The Wall is politically very relevant, but I do like Dark Side. Okay. There, that, there's no wrong answer there either. Uh, okay. We're almost done. Don't worry. I know it gets more uncomfortable as I continue. Uh, Pearl Jam or Nirvana? I like Nirvana. Mm -hmm. okay. I know that's like a basic ass answer, but like yeah. I'm, I'm very inspired. Yeah. yeah. But that being said, Pearl Jam is, is awesome as well. I grew up listening to a lot of this stuff. Yes. Pearl Jam is the right answer there, but it's cool. I'm not Okay. Mad. It's fine. <laughs> this interview is over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And then lastly, Lemmy or God? God? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. No, I was saying, is the oh, answer. Lemmy or God? Like God, like the deity? Like yeah. The, yeah the, okay. Yeah. It's a God? reference. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, it was, it was a, it's a, that's a reference to a movie Airheads, or they, it's, yeah. I, I, I it's um, okay. lived in a, in a hole, and I haven't seen a lot of movies. So. A, it came out quite some time ago, and it maybe I don't know. I feel like you're younger than me, so maybe it may even not be on that radar. But that's okay. Cultural references are not my forte, admittedly. So. Honestly, dude, they are never mine, and that's the one that I put in there under protest from a friend. And ninety percent of the people I ask it to look at me in the same way, like, and I'm like, oh god, I've offended them. Uh, I'm like, I'm about to offend a lot of religious people. Like, I don't. But see that some people in the chat are getting it. So the quick this is in the movie, they go, "Let me or God," and they go, "Let me is God." Trick question. So. Omar gets it. Thank you, Omar. Make me not look crazy. <laughs> cool. Well, I've I've exhausted all the wonderful things I could ask. I could ask a million more things, but I don't want to do that to you because I feel like that would just be too much. Oh, but, great. Thank you for asking such thought-provoking thought-provoking questions. Sorry. Yes, I try. I try with my monocle and very yeah. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes, I tried to do it. I poked myself in the eye. I was trying not to let everyone see that happened. Um, thank you so much. Continue to stay safe. And uh, uh, oh, yeah, here's a question. Do you have Halloween plans? Oh, yeah. I am uh, I have a really funny costume planned. I hope uh, I hope people will like it. I'm, I'm still collecting parts for it, but I plan to make it a joke, as I oftentimes do with everything. It's the best thing. <laughs> Laughter is medicine, guys. So always be yeah. funny. Um, thank you so much. Seriously, this is really, really cool. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out and, and yeah, uh, engaging in this. This has been fantastic. And uh, I'll, see, I'll see you soon. And then next week, I'm talking to Bruce Kulik from KISS. So that's going to be cool. So oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is super cool. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. Be good.